Hi, I'm Will Dunn. I'm the business editor at The New Statesman. And today I'm joined by Duncan Weldon to um, talk about his latest article for us. Uh, it's called Britain Has Never Faced Decline Like This Before. You have some, some interesting points about the history of that, that narrative of British decline. It is part of our national story in a way, isn't it? Um, how, how far does that go back? Well, you know, on sort of one grand sort of macroeconomic economic history level, the story of the British economy for the past 150, 170 odd years is a story of relative decline and a sort of, on one level, inevitable decline. You know, Britain was the first country to industrialise. The Industrial Revolution started here. Britain was the, the first country to experience modern economic growth. So in the sort of very late 18th, early 19th centuries, Britain forged out this sort of lead over pretty much every other country on the earth. And in your income per head, Britain was just the richest place in you know on the globe. But, you know, unless you think there's something, you know, very special about these islands or something in the water here, that was never going to last forever. Once that technology, those production techniques, that method of organizing your economy spread to other countries, it was a story of them catching up, you know, North America and Europe and Japan and then more recently you know, um, Eastern Europe, China, you know, that, that, that's the story, the story of relative decline, Britain not growing as fast as other countries. Um, that, you know, that, that's the big picture. But we shouldn't just content ourselves that this is something we always say about Britain and have done for a long time, as you say in the article. Britain now stands at a point in which our productivity growth relative to other countries is, is possibly as bad as it is ever been in the kind of in the modern period is that yeah so you know it's very easy to talk about that 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 big picture of decline and then look at the numbers and what's happening right now and the projections for the next few few years and sort of shrug your shoulders and say well yeah britain's declining again that's what britain does i think that would be misleading and also dangerous Uh, misleading because it's really important to put in context quite how bad the outlook is in Britain at the moment. You know, right now, you know, um, you look at sort of the consensus forecasts for economic growth. Britain is expected to have one of the deepest recessions of any advanced economy um, and one of the slowest recoveries. Britain is already, you know, sort of unique amongst the G7 economies, you know, those big industrial, those big advanced economies, um, as being the only one which where income per head or GDP is still below where it was when the pandemic hit. So we've fallen behind. We're expected to fall further behind. But it's not just about a bad few years. It's about a bad decade and a half. If you look at productivity growth, you know, the ability to get more output for any given level of inputs, whether that's labor or capital or whatever it is, you know, that's really, you know, in the long run, the most important driver of economic growth and of living standards. The 10 years before the financial crash in 2008, Britain had the second fastest productivity growth in the G7, behind only the United States. The 10 years afterwards, the second slowest in the G7, ahead of only Italy. You know, our productivity growth for the last 15 years has been abysmal. There are economic historians out there who've you know, looked back at the numbers, and obviously the further you go back with the numbers, the more imprecise they become. But they think productivity growth in the last 10, 15 years is the weakest it has been since the Industrial Revolution. I mean, you've got to go back 200 years to find the British economy performing quite this poorly over the last 10, 15 years. So I think it's it's misleading to say, you know, decline is just something that happens to Britain. And I think it's it's potentially dangerous as well because that sort of dismisses what is, you know, a really acute problem. And it's also not true to just say, well, these are global headwinds and everybody is facing the same problems because the uh, forecast decline in Britain's GDP over the, the, the coming year is much steeper than that of the uh, the EU and, and the US, isn't it? Um, um, just to um, ask what I think is, is a, a relatively basic question, but I hope a relevant one. Could you explain to me why it is so important to the man on the street, why relative growth is important. Why does it matter if our economy is growing much more slowly than that of France or Germany? What does that mean for the money in my pocket? Yeah, so I'll sort of step back for a second and say, 
you know, th there is no reason that Britain should have slower growth relative to countries like France and Germany, because productivity per worker in those countries is actually higher than it is in Britain. You know, we're sort of behind them in terms of the average French worker produces in four days what the average British worker produces in five. And because our productivity is lower, you would, to use the economist's favourite phrase, all things being equal, expect Britain to have relatively faster growth, you know, to be catching up to that productivity frontier. Mm -hmm. So just the fact we're not is, is on one level quite worrying. Why it should matter to sort of, you know, the average person on the street is this is the kind of thing which they are going to slowly notice over the coming years. You know, when they find themselves, you know, going on holiday, if they, you know, go to Spain for a week in the summer or, or, or whatever, firstly, they'll notice that the passport queues are a real issue after Brexit. Um, but once they get over that, what they will notice is the standard of living in Britain is not as high as it is in much of Western Europe. And that gap will gradually grow over time. Is that just a keeping up with the Joneses worry that, you know, your neighbor's house is getting nicer and yours isn't? Uh, maybe. But I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it, it's a thing people will feel. And I think this will, you know, slowly come to the fore in the national political debate. Why are we falling behind peer countries whom we used to be very comparable to in terms of our standard of living? Does that also play into the affordability of everything in this country that isn't made in this country. Yeah. And, you know, there's one reason why inflation has been a bit higher in Britain is due to last a bit longer. It's partially out of dependence on gas. It's partially these sort of new trade frictions that have been thrown up by Brexit. But yes, you know, a country that's not performing as well as the country, you know, ultimately what it means is that living standards in Britain will be lower than they otherwise would be. You know, that really should be the central thing that the economy is about, about, you know, ensuring growth in living standards is as high um, as it can be. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, you look at some of the projections. So we are, you know, we are slipping behind countries like France and Germany. We're already well behind the United States. Um, some of those countries in Central and Eastern Europe, you know, the, the rates of growth they are experiencing compared to Britain's, you will see convergence and perhaps even taking over. You know, these countries having a higher standard of living, higher GDP per head than Britain relatively quickly, sort of late 2020s, early 2030s, depending on which country you're looking at. You know, it's going to be this, this strange moment many people are going to have when, you know, 10 or 15 years' time, their child announces they're off to work as an au pair in Warsaw. Mm. And, 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 th and this, you know, makes sense. So for kids in school now... Uh, you know, by the time they enter the workforce, they may very well find that Britain is, you know, uh, a kind of economy that is comparable to that of Poland or Slovakia. France and Germany will be viewed as our, our rich neighbours. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's, nothing is inevitable. But, you know, on, on current trends, that's what you're talking about. You know, I mean, Britain, you know, the, the example I always go back to is Italy. And, you know, Italy in sort of the early 1990s was a country with standard of living very comparable to Germany. Germany, France, Italy, all up there together as rich countries. And what you've seen in Italy is sort of a 25-year relative decline, falling behind those countries to the extent that Italy is now more comparable to Spain, you know, a very different place to France and Germany in terms of income per head. And, you know, that's sort of the warning with Britain. And, you know, it's easy to talk about lost decades. I mean, you know, we're essentially now halfway through a second lost decade you know without it ringing the sort of alarm bells i'd have expected that to ring and that as you say you know when you talk about um potentially a, a school leaver in in uh in the next decade uh saying well i'm off to work in uh in a, a faster better performing economy that would then become a kind of self-reinforcing uh prospect wouldn't it? that's the, the the sort of trap that that countries can get into that if you're if you're more skilled, uh, people are, are leaving, then, you know, you're, you're, that, that's also a, a further damage to your economy. Completely. And, you know, I think, um, you know, if you just look back to, the, you know, if you just look at the, sort of the wage numbers in Britain for the last 15 years, you know, I think the really striking thing is that sort of median earnings, for some, you know, the, the, in real terms, accounting for price changes for the person in the middle of the income distribution are expected to be in the mid-2020s, roughly where they were, in 2008. So sort of, you know, 15, 17, 18 years of no real growth in real pay. You know, it's just, you know, phenomenally 
unusual situation. But actually, if you add on, you know, the fact that taxes are rising on these people's incomes, um, you add on student loan repayments, you add on the price of housing, you add on how expensive childcare is in Britain. Um, you know, it's, it's really not that hard to sort of pull together a picture of why, you know, young graduates in particular might actually decide that, you know, their prospects are better off somewhere else. In terms of the extent to which these are the results of political choices, you've mentioned Brexit already. And in the piece, you give a really good description of Brexit as being like a, a kind of uh, giving a, a car a, sort of a, a slow puncture, you know, something that that, that wears out um, uh, value from the economy o- over time. But what are the other political choices that um, have created this situation? Uh, you know, I think of Brexit as a as a slow puncture, um, you know, not good for the car, um, and the kind of thing that takes a while to really show up. But I think the important thing is, you know, Brexit is a 2016 event. And this this sort of slow up burning economic crisis starts 2007, 2008. So, you know, to go back to the car analogy, there's clearly something wrong with the engine throughout this. Now we've got a broken engine and a busted tire. Not ideal. Um, you know, I think if you look at sort of the model of growth the British economy had in the 1990s into the 2000s, you know, sort of two decades, you know, economists sometimes called the great moderation when growth was steady and quite fast. Productivity growth was good. The jobs market was doing well with employment rising. Inflation was low and stable. This sort of, you know, golden age, as it were, of um, British growth in the 90s and 2000s. I think that economic model was very badly damaged by what happened in 2007 to 2009, the banking crisis, the financial crisis, whatever we want to call it. You know, that happened around the globe. Almost every country was affected by that crisis. But Britain, as a global centre of finance to which financial services had been making a rising contribution to um, economic growth for a couple of decades, was obviously particularly badly hit by that. I think that was a fundamental blow to Britain's model of economic growth. And then you get Brexit on top of that. So, you know, this sort of important motor of your growth has been damaged. And then you throw up trade barriers with your nearest, largest, richest trading partner, um, make importing from them a bit harder, make exporting them a bit harder. If that national business model was damaged by 2008, I worry it was sort of killed off by 2016 and Brexit. And I think that the political choice that really worries me is sort of the absence of a choice. The fact that our national business model has been sort of in two stages broken, but the attempt has been to sort of continue on as if it hasn't, sort of trying to make this old model work when sort of fundamental pillars of it have been knocked down. And, you know, what we're seeing now is we, we had the pandemic that hit every country. We had the um, energy price spike associated with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That's hit all the countries around Europe. But Britain is feeling these blows in a harder way, recovering from them at a slower pace. And, yeah, I think mean, you know, the fundamental, the, the final Sort of political choice, which was an act of choice, I will add into this, was the turn to austerity in 2010. And I think what happened there was, you know, the economy was recovering, um, but that sort of slamming on of the fiscal breaks as they started cutting spending, putting up taxes, you know, being more concerned about getting the ratio of government debt to GDP down, getting the government's deficit down, than supporting the recovery. I think that slowed the recovery. I think that almost certainly added to our productivity problems. And I think now, sort of more than a decade on, we're starting to sort of feel the impact of some of that cancelled government investment. If you look at things like the NHS, if you look at things like the state of some of our infrastructure. The thing about, you know, cancelling capital spending, you know, it's easy to do politically because, you know, roads don't have a vote in the way nurses do. So it's easy to do politically in the short term, but this is sort of the time frame, 10, 15 years, when you start to feel the impact of it. Yeah, and I, th- I think you're right. There's the, there has been for a long time a failure of, of grand sort of long-term vision that, you know, we are seeing now in things like, our, you know, lack of uh, national energy security, you know, the, the ability to generate our own energy. And um, and as you say, the, you know, taking the biggest biggest spender out of the economy and not, not entirely out of the economy but you know sort of um, reducing all of that 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 government spending that could have happened then you know that was 
there were lots and lots of businesses relying on that. But as you say, that uh, in in your piece, the the risk now is that that there there isn't a big idea. You know, where are the big ideas? And yeah. do you think that's a risk that applies on you know across the House of Commons? Basically, do you think that, that there is a lack of big ideas across the political spectrum? Yeah, I think what's really striking is you know we we start off by saying you know, the, the story of Britain's relative economic decline is a long one, a uh, very long running one. But, you know, there's a couple of sort of periods when it's really sort of came to the attention of public debate, the political debate, political elites. The years around the turn of the 20th century, sort of this first moment, sort of late, late Victorian into Edwardian times when you know, there weren't good economic statistics, but it was increasingly obvious that France had industrialized, Germany had industrialized, the United States had industrialized. They were, you know, British shops had, um, you know, foreign made goods appearing in them in big numbers for the first time. There was worries that, you know, Britain was losing its economic lead. And, you know, this this became sort of the center of political debate for, for many years. And you saw some radical solutions. The Conservative Party endorsed protectionism and thought, you know, what we need is tariff barriers to keep out these foreign goods and sort of a Sort of imperial unity around the empire to build it into one big economic block and that was sort of our vision and you know on the other side the sort of the liberal party came forward with what became new liberalism this sort of edwardian progressivism or birth of a nascent welfare state with old age pensions and unemployment insurance and this slightly more active role for the state in the economy you know, this was you know, a period of economic decline which caught political attention and saw big ideas coming out of both sides. You go to the 1970s, you know, when people were talking about Britain as the sick man of Europe. On the left, you see, you know, what becomes the, the alternative economic strategy. Again, you know, in some ways similar to the Tory strategy of 70 years before, you know, you have um, your tariff barriers, but you have um, much more active industrial policy, much more state investment. And on the right... You had the ideas which, when they were put into practice in the 80s, we came to call Thatcherism, you know, tearing up of the sort of post-war growth model, changing it all. You look at the political debate today when we're in a decline which is just empirically a much bigger deal than what was happening in the 70s or or at the turn of the um, 20th century. And... Those big ideas just aren't there. I mean, the closest we've came to seeing it in practice was the rather short-lived um, Liz Truss. Um. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, I mean, I guess it's a case of being careful what you wish for in terms of big <laughs> ideas. Because we, you know, we we spoke last year in in the in the wake of um, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng um, coming to to power with with some very big ideas and then being swiftly defenestrated by the bond markets um, and on the one hand those were I think a lot of people thought some pretty wild ideas in a, in a lot of ways perhaps with you know with 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 noble intentions but there were you know these these um, commitments that led people to conclude that the um, government debt would be unsustainable and it was just uh, not well thought through not communicated properly and the crisis that it caused was a disaster that that could have got a lot worse. Um, but on the other side, does that mean that you know that that British politicians now have to be more careful about what they say in order to avoid spooking the foreign investors who buy our debt, which is what allows us to raise the money for public spending? Yeah, I think look, what you need is you need big ideas, but you need you need workable big ideas <laughs> rather than wild big ideas. Because the lesson of that um, was it um, six weeks of um, Liz Truss and um, and Kwasi Kwarteng. I, I mean, I think what would be nice would be if we had sort of a vision of what we wanted the British economy to look like in the early twenty thirties. You know, if we said, you know, okay, what, what do we think are going to be the drivers of growth? What skills and infrastructure do we need? To, to ensure we've got those drivers in place, to sort of have a fundamental sort of root and branch review of you know, what, what the role of government is in the economy, what it can do to support businesses, um, you know, where we expect the growth to come from. And what would be really nice, I always say, would be, I always think would be, um, the economic debate in Britain is, is sometimes very strange. It sometimes seems that we have a political elite and a political debate which is not very happy about the things we are good at 
and talks more about the things we are bad at. So, you know, there's lots of envy for German vocational education or German um, manufacturing prowess. And you know, fine, but you know, I think you are more likely to succeed if you start by looking at where is the United Kingdom already economically strong mm -hmm. and how do we add to that rather than how do we make ourselves more like a country across the North Sea. You know, if you if you were to ask, you know, foreign observers looking at the British economy, what's the British economy good at? They would say it has one of the strongest university sectors in the world, which are effectively an export industry as well. It's got huge strength in services, and it's not just financial services. It's all sorts of professional and technical services, whether that's you know architecture or lawyers or accountants, a management consultants, even all of these different types of the um, service sector. It's very strong in the creative industries. Rather than trying to you know, beat ourselves up, why is Britain not very good at producing steel? To say, actually, look, Britain is this leading services provider. How can we get even better at that rather than, you know, how can we do something completely different? Yeah. But you also have to do that at the same time as addressing the um, pronounced inequality, yes. income inequality within the, yeah. the British economy, right? Because you can't have an economy entirely composed of lawyers and film directors. No, not at all, not at all, not at all. Not at all. Um, that would be a very horrible place to live, I imagine. But no, no, completely. You know, in terms of where's the growth going to come from, to get techie about it, you step back, you look at the economy and you think, you know, the economy you can sort of on one level say there are two, there are two sectors. There's this high productivity, high value add sector. But, you know, by definition, because it's really high productivity, it doesn't employ very many people. And then you've got the rest of the economy. And, you know, economies that do it well, I think sort of somewhere like Japan is quite interesting on this. That It's got this incredibly high productivity manufacturing and tech and a bit of financial services sector. And that does incredibly well and helps keep the country as a whole a rich country. But they've managed to find a way that, you know, the benefits of that are shared with those not working directly in that sector. So, I mean, you look at Britain, you say, OK, you want to support professional services broadly defined. You want to support creative industries. You want to support the universities. You want to support science and life sciences and pharmaceuticals. You want these all to be doing... You want to be leaning into things like um, renewable energy, where there's huge potential just geographically in Britain. Do all of that as much as you can. And that's going to be very, very good for the economy. But whilst you're doing that, don't just concentrate on growing the size of the economy. Think about people working in the rest of the service sector, whether that's retail workers, people working in childcare, social care, whatever, and how can we ensure that their wages, terms and conditions are, you know, benefiting from this economic growth? Duncan Weldon, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and um, please do head to the New Statesman website to um, read Duncan's piece uh, and uh, our other pieces uh, on uh, UK politics and the economy. And uh, if you've enjoyed this video, um, there should be a link appearing above me right now um, with links to our other videos. Thank you.